Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Girish Kulkarni. I'm a urological oncologist and associate professor at the University of Toronto in the Division of Urology. We're in the Department of Surgery and Surgical Oncology. And I'll be presenting a phase one data and an introductory uh, uh, session on uh, non muscle invasive bladder cancer and how it relates to Theralase. So, uh, non muscle invasive bladder cancer is one group of bladder cancer. Bladder cancer can basically, basically be divided into muscle invasive and non muscle invasive components. The vast majority of patients have non -muscle, inv muscle invasive disease. So, if you look at our cartoon on the left hand side, these patients, the carcinoma in situ, the TA, and the T1 uh, patients are non muscle invasive. The usual treatment for these high grade tumors um, is BCG therapy after a transurethral resection. Uh, BCG is a form of immunotherapy that's been around for uh, decades, uh, but there hasn't been much in terms of new development uh, over the past 30 years. Now we have uh, problems with BCG in that there are shortages, so BCG availability is a problem. As I mentioned, there haven't been many innovations over the past 30 years, so there are limited treatment options in patients who have these uh, types of tumors who actually fail BCG. Um, and in that scenario, patients are then faced with a large operation called radical cystectomy, which takes a full day, usually uh, at least a week to recover and many months of recovery at home. So there is a very large unmet need uh, for these types of patients that are failing BCG. Uh, so the opportunity we have here is to create uh, a new drug or technology that can preserve bladder function, so avoid radical cystectomy. Uh, it, we need a, a treatment that is highly efficacious and also safe. Um, by safe, we mean the preserving bladder function. And then this also translates into a better quality of life for patients so that they have their native bladders and they can urinate normally. So uh, this is where our photodynamic therapy uh, comes into play. Examples of uh, photosensitizers are uh, uh, photofrin, 5-ALA, HAL, radichlorin. These are injectable uh, uh, photosensitizers. A number of these agents have been used in the past uh, with uh, varying levels of success. However, uh, the big issue with these photosensitizers is the collateral damage they cause to the bladder. So as I mentioned in the other slide uh, uh, earlier on, safety is an important issue, as is maintaining quality of life. So previous uh, uh, photosensitizers were associated with a lot of urinary frequency, uh, fibrosis of the bladder, and difficulty um, maintaining a normal urinary function post-treatment. So for that reason, those older therapies were primarily abandoned. Uh, and that's what we mean here in terms of the primary issues, collateral damage to other uh, surrounding tissues, normal bladder. Uh, the other issue with some of these older agents is the systemic absorption of the photosensitizer. So not only is it uh, uh, present in the bladder, but because they were injectable uh, or absorbed, they would be in the bloodstream. So if a patient was exposed to normal light, then their skin may uh, uh, be subject to the activation of the photosensitizer. So whatever is used uh, happening to kill the bladder cancer cells would be uh, at the skin level too. So patients could have skin uh, reactions and sensitive sensitivity. They would have to be kept in dark rooms uh, to prevent uh, uh, exposure to light. So that, that made it difficult uh, to um, bring these photosensitizers, these treatments to, uh, to light in terms of uh, solutions for bladder cancer. So what uh, the Theralase uh, uh, product actually does is it allows us to circumvent some of these issues. So the product is TLD1433, that is the photosensitizer, and it has a specificity for bladder cancer cells. The way, what I mean by that is when it's instilled within the bladder, when it's placed within the bladder, it uh, binds to transferrin. Transferrin is a protein that is primarily um, expressed on bladder cancer cells, much more so than on normal cells. So these bladder cancer cells can then selectively absorb the drug. Um, so that's one method to overcome some of the uh, problems of the previous photosensitizers. Another method is to actually 
uh, account for the, uh, the dose of light that is used to activate the drug. Uh, historically, a light would simply be shone within the bladder, uh, and it was very difficult to measure the amount of light received. Uh, but with a new laser light delivery system, we can now account for the shape, the volume, and internal reflection uh, of light within the bladder. So those are two big innovations that have uh, helped uh, uh, bring TLD 1433 into um, uh, trial mode uh, with promising uh, uh, results, which I will then uh, demonstrate here. So the results come from a phase one trial. Uh, this is a phase 1b trial in BCG unresponsive bladder uh, cancer patients. And the way we designed this trial was to have three patients start at uh, the maximum recommended starting dose. That was 0.35 milligrams per centimeter squared. That was half the therapeutic dose. If there was no safety issue, then the next three patients would receive the therapeutic dose at 0.75, uh, 0 0.70 milligrams per centimeter squared. And as I mentioned, these patients are the patients that have failed BCG. Uh, and there are new definitions now of what that means. So they're BCG unresponsive. Uh, the primary endpoint was safety and tolerability as it is in a phase 1B trial. We just want to make sure that we weren't causing the collateral damage with our selective uh, photosensitizer and the new technology to measure light. Are we actually overcoming some of the problems that we had in the past um, in terms of photo uh, dynamic therapy? Secondary endpoints were pharmacokinetics, absorption of the drug. And finally, we had an exploratory efficacy endpoint uh, to see how did these patients actually do. So here's an example of what uh, the uh, TLD 1433 looked like when we instilled it within the bladder. We would instill it within the bladder for an hour pre Operatively, the patient would receive a general anesthetic, and then we would shine the light, a green light, uh, to activate the drug uh, while the patient is asleep. So when we first looked into the bladder, we could see deposition uh, and accumulation of the drug, the agent which is seen in orange here in the middle of the screen, at the regions of where there uh, would be residual or scar tissue uh, that would represent uh, places of uh, bladder uh, cancer. So that pointed to some of the uh, visual uh, selectivity of the drug. So these are the results. We're getting right into the results. So number one, I said, was safety and tolerability. Uh, there were no severe life-threatening or disabling uh, side effects or deaths. Uh, that's the worst in terms of uh, severity of an AE uh, adverse event. Uh, any treatment, regardless if we... Uh, provide TLD 1433, light, et cetera, will have some side effects uh, simply from us even doing the cystoscopy. So there were 38 in total mild to moderate uh, adverse events. Um, overall though, there were no adverse events that were greater than grade two. So grade three, four, and five are usually the worst adverse events. Uh, grade one and two are usually well tolerated. And the vast majority of patients uh, did have resolution of these uh, side effects over time. Um, in terms of the pharmaco pharmacokinetics, this is the second endpoint. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see the concentration of TLD-1433 in the urine. Uh, what's important to note is the uh, uh, units of measurement on the y-axis is nanograms per milliliters. Um, and regardless of the dose, 0.35 or 0.7, the curves are overlapping. Within 24 hours, there is no more detectable drug in the urine. Now, on the right-hand side are the plasma concentrations, and on the y-axis, it's important to note now the unit here. This is picograms per milliliter, so it's one thousandth of the level of the amount found in the urine. So right away, that's a, a positive sign. And then you can see, depending on the dose, uh, the blue line is 0.7, the, uh, the black line is 0.35. Uh, there is relatively rapid uh, clearance of the agent. So within 72 hours, almost all drug uh, all photosensitizer is cleared. And even then it's at 1,000, one 1,000th one of the um, uh, concentration. And then finally, uh, these are the results, the exploratory efficacy results. Uh, patients one, two, and three were treated at half dose. So that was the uh, starting safety dose. And they all had BCG unresponsive disease. Uh, all of these patients did have a recurrence. Um, no one had a disease progression at 180 days. 
But this allowed us to then, after a data safety monitoring board uh, meeting, move forward to the uh, higher dose, which is the true therapeutic dose. So that's patients four, five, and six on the right-hand side here. And uh, very encouragingly, uh, only one patient had a recurrence. Uh, and two, even up to one year out from treatment, remain free of disease. Um, and these patients were uh, CIS patients as well. So that's actually quite encouraging uh, in terms of uh, a signal uh, for this product. So basically, to summarize, good safety profile, very little systemic absorption, and none of the skin sensitivity and light sensitivity that we saw with other agents and a promising signal in early phase one uh, development, which is the reason why uh, we've now launched into phase two. Good, a Good afternoon, I'm Michael Jewett. I am the chair of the Medical and Scientific Advisory Board of Theralase, and I'm a uro-oncologist at Princess Margaret Cancer Center at the University of Toronto in Toronto, Canada. I'm sorry I can't be with you this afternoon. I'm out of the country at a meeting and I couldn't change that plan to be here. I like to come to the AGM and to meet with uh, the interested uh, parties who are very knowledgeable about bladder cancer in my experience. So I've been asked today to present the uh, plans for the phase two study, which are well advanced and follow the phase one B study that you've already heard about. The phase two study is a study that is in many ways more straightforward than they've been in the past with agents that have gone before the Theralase product. The reason is that we now have a guidance from the American uh, FDA uh, that came out last year that makes it very clear what endpoints we should be looking for uh, for regulatory approval as well as the uh, indications and inclusion indications for a trial. So uh, specifically to speak to the slide before you, uh, the phase two study is going to be not only multi-center but multinational beginning in Canada and Therale staff have been working with us to recruit sites that are well advanced, signed up, and we have a patient pending and by the time this video is aired may have actually enrolled uh, as the first patient on this phase two study. Uh, so we're shooting for approximately 20 sites and we met with many of the principal investigators for these sites in Chicago at the annual meeting of the American Urological last month. And uh, the company is sponsoring up to 125 patients. This number will be potentially clarified with the FDA, but we know uh, from the guidance and from discussions with members of our MSAB that we're going to need at least 100 patients. What, what is useful though uh, for us is the clear efficacy endpoints have been defined with a condition that you saw in the previous slide, carcinoma in situ, which I like to think of as a shag carpet patch in the middle of a standard piece of broadloom. So it's typically a red patch, it is biopsyable, it sheds cells into the urine to be seen on a urine test called urinary cytology. And the uh, diagnosis is very clear to pathologists, so there won't be a need to centrally review the biopsies on these patients. You saw in the previous slide, papillary tumors occur with this carcinoma in, uh, in situ condition frequently, and those will be removed by the surgeon at the time of diagnosis. So we're looking at carcinoma in situ, and uh, the patients have also, importantly, failed treatment with BCG, the standard therapy, again, which you heard about. And these patients are defined rigorously as unresponsive, as an eligible eligibility criteria. So uh, in summary, at the bottom here, BCG unresponsive, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer in the lining, single arm, uh, clinical trial, and the endpoint being complete response, no evidence of disease, and how long that response lasts is equally important. Uh, and we're using a 12-month endpoint. So this, we believe, uh, both professionally as clinicians, but also the sponsor 
uh, has uh, confidence that if we can achieve these endpoints, then uh, the FDA will look very favorably on approval of the agent. So uh, just to elaborate a little bit on this uh, complete response or CR as we refer to it clinically uh, at uh, points along the uh, timeline after treatment at uh, 90 days is typically the first assessment point. And then once the patient achieves that complete response, which we anticipate will be met, uh, those patients will be followed through, as I said. Uh, so these uh, time points will include an examination of the bladder lining with the cystoscope. It's a telescopic examination and the urine will be collected and it will not show any cancer cells. Uh, if there are cancer cells, however, this may be coming from other areas of the urinary tract that wouldn't have been treated. And if we can define that, uh, then that still constitutes a CR despite those. And if a patient has some abnormality at cystoscopy, that is of uncertain nature, then that will be um, biopsied. And if it's negative for carcinoma in situ, that will constitute um, a complete response. Uh, the secondary endpoint in this trial is a standard is to look at the side effects of the treatment. Uh, so adverse events, you saw a scale for those, and we anticipate this will be a minor uh, issue as it was in the phase one. This somewhat complex uh, diagram of the various time points I've spoken to already, but essentially the patients are evaluated and after a period of screening, they will be treated and the clock starts there. And then at 90 days, and these have uh, acronyms V6 for that interval, and subsequently the patients are seen at six months and all the way out to the full year when the final complete response endpoint is achieved. And that is very clearly the standard of co conduct for these clinical trials. Uh, this is the schedule of the uh, site activations. I've spoken to the uh, Canadian onboarding happening this year with enrollment, and the rate of enrollment is somewhat uncertain because this is a crowded space currently. Uh, full disclosure, there are other trials being conducted and we're working with these sites uh, to take on this trial or they've already agreed to take on the trial knowing that there's going to be some jockeying uh, between uh, patients for different trial eligibility but we're confident based on the track record of these sites who are experienced sites, they are key opinion leader led sites uh, with uh, a lot of close ties to us uh, at Theralase and the local principal investigator that we're confident that they will meet their uh, uh, obje objective uh, recruitment rates. Um, then the uh, meeting with the FDA, uh, the European and American sites will be brought on. Uh, we will enroll those patients over time from the first patient follow-up is ongoing for a year after the last patient is enrolled and then the closeout which is currently uh, targeted for uh, 2021 and most importantly submissions uh, that uh, year 2021. Uh, these are targets that have been established by the management at Theralays and uh, seem to be reasonable uh, sites. So uh, just speaking again to the way this actual treatment is done. These cartoons represent the key steps. These are important because they have to be organized at each site and there are plans to mentor each site in these key steps. So there will be consistency across all, all sites. And this will involve members of the urology staff at Princess Margaret going out to uh, be present at the treatments of the first at least one patient at each site. And we're confident from our pre-meetings that we can achieve that consistency. So the pharmacies at each of the uh, centers that are going to enroll patients will be instructed on how to mix up the drug so we know that we're getting a standard dose and calculating that the patient's volume um, individualized, personalized for their bladders can be retained in the bladder uh, for the hour <clears throat> prior to treatment. And uh, 
uh, we've spoken a bit to this uh, TLD 1433 photosensitizer, and uh, this is a, a ruthenium-based photosensitizer that you've seen the slides of how we uh, have observed it to selectively bind to the bladder cancer cells, and we can actually see that uh, endoscopically subsequent to the, the installation. And this is allowed to dwell in the bladder, put in through a catheter, patients awake. This is a standard uh, clinical process. Uh, it is not irritating and they uh, hold that in their bladder while the uh, drug is absorbed uh, selectively to the cancer cells. Then the patients are taken into the operating room and the, currently the patients are going to be anesthetized. We have uh, hope that possibly in the future this could be done without a full anesthetic <clears throat> and the patient is uh, checked again with the scope and this is a, uh, a picture, uh, well this is actually putting the drug drug in uh, next to the operating room, then the patient's wheeled into the operating room and we hope that this drug will be, have been absorbed into the, the bladder cells. And this is a cartoon of that process of the uh, photosensitizer uh, adhering to the uh, bladder tumor cells and being uh, brought into the cells. And here we see a um, fluorescent picture showing the, the cells local uh, with the uh, photofrin, uh, sorry, the uh, TLD 1433 localized into the uh, cell structure, uh, which is uh, proof of principle. And we've uh, have done this in the preclinical studies uh, that what we believe is happening is actually happening. So the patient's bladder is emptied and they go into the operating room and uh, given the anesthetic and the patient's bladder is uh, irrigated free of this uh, photosensitizer, so roughly an hour of dwell time. And here's the uh, picture of the uh, bladder uh, about to be inspected by the urologist with the cystoscope, which is a flexible catheter-like uh, endoscope uh, that has fiber optics and uh, is a uh, uh, a standard, again, standard instrument used uh, around the world for assessing bladder cancer. Uh, the bladder is uh, distended with uh, fluid, in this case sterile water, so much like urine collecting in the bladder, and that allows a space in which the uh, laser light can be introduced and, um, sorry, um, the laser fiber is inserted in the end of the same scope, which is positioned in the center of the bladder, as you can see, much like a light bulb with a diffuser tip on the end of this uh, laser. And the laser is connected and uh, the light is, the laser light is uh, turned on. Now, the important thing for me and really what has attracted me um, beside the photosensitizer characteristics is the way that this instrument has been developed to allow for measurement of the amount of total light that impacts on the, the bladder wall. So the laser fiber, as I said, like a light bulb, emits these um, narrow wavelength uh, light beam and the amount that hits the bladder is approximately equivalent to what comes out of the laser, but then there is bouncing or reflection of that light off the shiny surface of the bladder, and that adds to the cumulative dose. And we didn't appreciate that when we did the original Photofrin study uh, about 20, uh, 25 years ago. And at that time, we ended up in retrospect over treating patients because we didn't allow for that. So Theralase, in response to that concern, has built in uh, this dosimeter which measures the sum of incident and reflected light uh, to minimize the risks to the patient and their normal tissues. And in fact, in the phase one study, I think they were vindicated in that and it's been very exciting for us to move into this phase two uh, study. Uh, the simplicity of the delivery system of that laser light is also appealing and the connecting of it, the measuring of it can now be done by the urologist. We don't anticipate as we did in the phase one, requiring a physicist to be present to do uh, the calculations. 
which again is an important thing for adoption of this technology. There is a lot of laser safety um, concern in the uh, medical field and the staff are uh, familiar with that. They're trained, they're qualified to use lasers. This is all lasers. So bringing a laser into the operating room is not going to be unique to this bladder cancer therapy, but it is part of the process that we're ensuring that the people around this uh, patient are uh, going to uh, avoid any injury from the laser fiber. Um, <clears throat> so the the positioning of this, let's call it the light bulb in the bladder is important. And this is done by visually looking in through the cystoscope, which is this instrument uh, you can see here. So again, this is in the repertoire of the clinician to be able to uh, localize that uh, in three dimensions um, uh, by experience of using instruments in the bladder. The treatment time uh, is going to be give or take an hour currently, and that's within the customary range of doing treatments to the lining of the bladder, whether it's a surgical procedure or a, say a cautery, some form of uh, removal of tumor. So again, it is a comfortable time frame uh, for operating rooms and anesthesia staff, nursing staff, and not out of the ordinary. Initially in the phase one, we were obviously a little bit longer, but as this becomes routine, I, I think it's a very achievable uh, target. Um, the, at the end of the procedure, the uh, disposable um, instruments for the delivery of the light fiber are removed uh, from the patient and are not reusable and are discarded. Um, the cystoscope is slipped out of the urethra, the urinary tube. Um, most of these patients are males, but the, the, about a quarter or a third, ultimately we expect to be female, uh, done the same way. And the patient is then transported from the operating room when they are out of their anesthetic in a standard way uh, into the recovery area. And then later that same day, they're discharged. So this is an outpatient procedure. And from our experience with the phase one, it's been uh, very straightforward. Um, so uh, in summary, uh, we're very excited by this uh, phase two study, which is about to open. And uh, we are uh, anticipating that we'll recruit as planned. Uh, there's a lot of excitement at our uh, investigator meeting we held uh, just a month ago uh, in Chicago and the uh, potential investigators really were uh, quite intrigued. Some of them very, very experienced investigators from around the world who've been through many trials. So we wish everybody well and we're optimistic.